This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. The fourth episode of Philly DA focuses on probation and parole. Philadelphia DA Larry Krasner refers to it as, quote, mass supervision, the evil twin of mass incarceration. The episode tells the story of Latanya Myers, a formerly incarcerated person who becomes an activist who helps people who are arrested um, with navigating the bail review system. In this clip, Myers addresses a Pennsylvania state Senate hearing on probation reform. Within the last 18 months, I was able to start school, start community college. I apologize, I'm a little nervous, but I was able to find my voice and become an advocate, to, to be a part of the solution and not the problem. I think when it comes to true probation reform, we have to start with the reform of the culture in the probation department. I mean, a culture in a probation department is not one that's encouraging. It's not empowerment. When I got on probation, all I was told was I have to come in here weekly and report. I was looked at as high risk because of an algorithm that, no matter what I accomplished, until 2027, it would never change. <sighs> that is a meaningless, endless cycle, a cycle of trauma, a cycle of pain, and, and some of the effects can be irreversible. We just want to give a true, fair second chance, not a second-class citizen, but a fair second chance to prove ourselves and to build our communities up. Thank you. That's a clip from Philly DA of activist Latanya Myers testifying about probation reform. This is another clip featuring Latanya. I'm getting ready to go to the probation office. Depression is everything, because all they know is what they read on that paper. She don't know who I am for real. So, gonna make a good impression. She got my life in her hands. I made the wrong impression. She might make the wrong decision or the wrong assumption, you know? For a relationship, you can walk away. You can't walk away from this. It was a couple days after my 12th birthday. I woke up that morning and my mom's boyfriend had took her bed and dragged it all the way down the steps. He was out of control. I thought that I could protect my mom. And I picked up like an air freshener can and I hit him with it. He went to a payphone, called the police. When I seen the cops, I thought that they would understand what was going on. I was charged with aggravated assault in the first degree. That's stopped. That was the first time I ever was in jail. For three days, I didn't know where my mom was at. I didn't know if any of my family knew where I was at. I was just there. And I'll cry so hard. Finally, my lawyer pulled me to the side and she says, your grandma's here. You take this probation, you go home with your grandma today. Or go back to jail for another 10 days to fight this case. I chose to go home with my grandma. I'm 29, and that first felony from when I was 12 years old is what it brings up time and time again, my only felony on my record that I shouldn't even have. That's Latanya Myers in Philly, D.A., the PBS series that's airing now. <clears throat> Latanya joins us now. She is support coordinator for the Philadelphia Community Bail Fund, also the founder of the organization Above All Odds. Still with us, Nicole Salazar, co-creator of the PBS series Philly, D.A., Latanya, welcome to Democracy Now! The figures are absolutely astounding. Um, you have Philadelphia as the second most supervised state in the country after Georgia. Um, New York has 12,000 people under probation and parole. 
Uh, it's six times larger than Philadelphia. Philadelphia has 40,000 people under <clears throat> probation and parole. Your story tells the story of what so many people are going through. Um, if you can take us from those clips to why you became an activist on this issue, why you think it is a critical civil rights issue in this country right now. First, I just want to say thank you all so much for allowing me to be on this segment today and talk about these issues that, that impact us so greatly. When we talk about probation and reform, probation and parole, that is the streamline to mass incarceration. And the reason, you know, I was inspired in being an advocate, um, I found my purpose through my pain. You know, I was arrested. I didn't know what advocate or activist was until I um, started to voice, um, raise the voices of our concerns and learned that it was a community of organizers. It was a community of people that understood that and explained to me that this was systematically happening on purpose. Um, so I just wanted to lift up those voices um, of those that wasn't being heard, to let people know that we're closest to the problem, so we're closest to the solution. We don't no longer will allow anyone to tell us that, you know, we can't and won't change if given an opportunity, nor conform to the negative stigmas that's attached to, to us as returning citizens. So this work has became my life and my purpose to help others. And, and, and Latanya, a lot of people are not aware how the parole and probation system works in terms of mass incarceration. In, in Pennsylvania, more than half of the people ad, uh, admitted into the prison system are uh, as a result of violations of probation or parole. Uh, what's been done to uh, attempt to reform that system? Um, so there have been many attempts, you know, statewide attempts, um, bipartisan efforts. Uh, I know that the Defenders Association of Philadelphia has filed 1,700 early termination petitions, 85 of them, 85 percent of them, which has been uh, individuals have been granted early termination. But this is on a case by case basis. You know, we need something more robust, more statewide um, on caps. In, in Philadelphia, a judge can sentence you until you cease to live on this earth to be on probation and parole. 20 and 30 plus year sentences for probation and parole. Um, and I think that needs to stop. So I am happy to hear the efforts that the Defenders um, Association is doing, but it, particularly the efforts that grassroots organizations um, and impacted people are doing to let let individuals know that we want to be a part of this conversation. We need to be a part of this change. We need to allow people to know that our narrative of what it is. We just want to be uh, citizens. We want to be heard. We want to be uplifted. We want to be supported and endorsed like everyone else. Um, in order for us to be successful, that we need people's support and understanding that we just we just want a, 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 a part of the American dream, but it hasn't been American dream for us. It's an American nightmare. Nicole Salazar, um, in the film, Larry Krasner says one in fourteen African American Philadelphians are um, are. Uh, under probation or parole. Um, and the significance of what not only the DA's office is doing, but trying to pressure judges. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think probation and parole is one of those areas where you really see how, you know, the DA has a lot of discretion and a lot of power, but also a lot of limits on what they can do. So one of the main drivers of, of excessive supervision in Pennsylvania is actually state law, sentencing laws. That, that are formulated in such a way that you're, you have basically a minimum and a maximum. So you can be sentenced you know, to a five to 10 year sentence in Pennsylvania, whereas in another state, you might be able to get a flat you know, four year sentence, four years in prison, and maybe you know, some probation on top of that. But in Pennsylvania, because it's always in this you know, formulation of X to two X, you automatically, you know, if you're released after your minimum of, of 10 years, you're gonna then serve that same amount on parole. So that would be 10 years in prison, 10 years on parole, then possibly plus an additional probation sentence on top of that. So that's sort of baked into Pennsylvania law. And so that's something that, you know, on a local county level in, in Philadelphia, you cannot, you cannot change. Um, but what they do have discretion over is, is more of the probation tail that is assigned. And they've, you know, made efforts. What you see in the film is, is basically, you know, a two-pronged effort of what they're trying to do 
One is for cases going forward that they're trying to limit overall supervision, so parole plus probation, to three years for felony cases and an average of 18 for misdemeanor cases. And so, you know, they have a tremendous amount of discretion there because, you know, nationally, 95 percent of all uh, criminal cases are resolved through negotiated pleas. And so a negotiated plea basically means the, the prosecutor and the defense attorney come together with, you know, with a proposed sentence that they then present to the judge. And for the most for the most part, judges will accept those pleas because, you know, if they didn't, if every case had to go to trial, and you hear this in the film and people say it all the time, you know, the system would literally collapse if all of those cases, thousands of cases coming through the system every year that are being handled by 60-odd judges in Philadelphia, if they all went to trial, the system would collapse. And so there's a lot of pressure on the judges to accept those negotiated pleas. So that's kind of where that discretionary power um, really comes into play. But the other part of what they're trying to do, and this is where you see a lot of pushback from the judges in the film, is that they would like to, um, on, a, on a large scale, revisit so many of those 40,000 people who are on probation uh, or parole in Philadelphia who are doing well, and like Latanya was saying, have them uh, terminated early from that probation. And here's where you really sort of need cooperation between the judges and the DA's office and the, and the public defender's office. Because what they were hoping to do was sort of, you know, look look on sort of like a, a, a broad data scale and see, you know, how many people do we have on probation? How well are they doing? Are there people that, you know, just with the signing of a pen where we could just sign the forms and, and get a lot of people off probation at once? Um, but what you see basically is that ju the judiciary does not want to move that quickly. They still are, um, many of them, very married to sort of this idea that being on probation is actually, you know, pro-public safety, even though there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of compelling evidence that actually shows, you know, why actually being on probation can be criminogenic just because of all of the hurdles that are, are put before somebody to be on probation and still be able to maintain other aspects of their life, their job, their family. Um, and so you see in the film that the judiciary is not really ready to take this step. They're not able to do it on a broad scale. You know, there was there was hope at some point that even Latanya's case might possibly be included in, in sort of these mass petitions they were trying to do, but that uh, doesn't go forward. And there are, um, I think, nine judges at the time of, of the end of that episode who do say, OK, we're going to do some you know, mass early terminations just in terms of our individual lists. And that process is still ongoing, but it wasn't as robust a process as they were hoping for. Latanya, um, if you can talk about your own organization against all odds and what you're hoping to see right now, and if a progressive DA like Larry Krasner, who's up for re-election, really does make a difference uh, in Philadelphia, what does it look like to you, uh, working with so many people on probation and parole who are captured by the system? Well, I just want to say thank you for that question, and I think when Nicole brought up a good point. All through this episode, you hear the judges saying, we don't want them to break the system. They're going to break the system. Well, the system needs to be broken and abolished in order to restore and heal our community, because it's breaking us apart. It's tearing our families apart. And, you know, I just hope that our community continue to be civically engaged. I hope that people look at this film and be inspired to know that they can, too, advocate. They can go to their local representatives. They can advocate for themselves in a the courtroom. We have to know that we have the power to uplift the voices to make the impact that we need. You know, we have to depend and understand that we are the force that makes the power. We can't put it in one person's hand. But what we can do is make sure that our voices are heard and our narratives are correct. And that, and that is that we want to bring hope and healing back into our community, um, not any harm. So I just want to say thank you to all the people um, that was able to support me in the community. And I want others to support um, other people. And I wanted my organization to be able to support people to have those resources, to have that community impact. When people go in those courtrooms alone, they don't have to do it alone. You know, we have a community of people that can correct this narrative that's trying to get depicted on us to keep us entangled, further entangled in this assist into the system. Um, so I just... I just thank, you know, the, the film crew and everyone for allowing um, me to have this opportunity to inspire. I want individuals that's held on probation and parole to stay strong, to understand that you can get off, that we are fighting, that you are not your worst mistake. If I did it, you can do it. 
any support that I had, I want people to be able to galvanize the support around individuals that's currently going through it. We have people that have, you know, lost their life, lost their job, lost lost family members, while we're slowly waiting for the system to turn, uh, change, and, and, and be more compassionate and uplifting. They spent $344 million on incarcerating individuals in, in Pennsylvania for technical violations. And that, that they didn't even catch a case. If we take a percentage of that and reinvest it into addressing the issues as to why individuals can't make it to their probation appointment on time, why is it hard for them to find uh, housing when it's discriminate when they're discriminated on housing applications for, for for employment? If they can't, if they're boxed out of you know opportunities to to climb in careers, if they boxed out of opportunities to live you know in in in, in better neighborhoods. Um, or, or even a black out of opportunities uh, to get Pell Grants to go back to school, how can they really think, you know, we're, we're going to be able, if we're not really able to be in amongst our communities with the same resources, with the same opportunities of others? Right now, in Philadelphia, the commissioner is, 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 is requesting $750 million for the police budget. $750 million that right now she's testifying and asking our city council to, to allot this for, for, the, for the budget. There's not a percentage. How much is going to take for us as a community to reinvest into the problem and not locking us up? You know, and, and, and that's what we just ask for as a community, for people to, to allow us to be in these spaces and talk about the resources that we need and that's most helpful. And I want individuals to be uplifted, specifically individuals that's people of color and the LGBT community. I want them to know, know that we exist, you know, that we are fighting and that you are heard and that you're not alone. Um, and that you can do the same thing that I did with the community support. And let's keep focus on civic engagement and individuals finding their voices and sitting at the table of power and speaking truth to that power.